The gospel reading for today is the basis for the sermon message. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me. Because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. Do you guys know that song? Okay, I saw a few nods. That's basically all you need to know about the song is that that's the lyric of it. I hate that song. I have always hated that song. You might have heard by how good I am at singing it how much I hate that song. But when I was a kid, we used to sing that. We would stand in front of the congregation and sing it. And I said one day while we were practicing loud enough to one of my classmates that the teacher heard, I don't want to be a sheep. Uh, And the teacher heard it and said, well, think about it this way. Jesus is the Lamb of God. You get to be more like Jesus when you become a sheep. And I just quietly raised my hand. She called on me and I said, wasn't Jesus also like a lion or something? (laughs) And it's true. He was. He's the Lion of Judah. I was thinking more of Aslan as like the guy that chases the bad guys out. But that's what I want to do. I don't want to be a sheep. All you hear the whole time you're growing up is how silly and foolish and helpless sheep are. I want to be a lion. And then I lived a little bit of life. And my uncle passed away, and less than a month later, my grandpa followed him. And it didn't matter how loud I roared, there was nothing I could do about it. And then I met the failures and struggles of life. And sometimes they were my fault, but sometimes they were out of my hands. I remember getting my first job and that helpless feeling of getting my first paycheck and realizing how much of what I worked hard for I don't get. No matter what we think, we're sheep. Because we come into circumstances in life where we can roar as loud as we want, but we aren't the lions. We aren't in control of our situation we're helpless. And that's why Jesus' words for us this morning are so essential when he says, I am the good shepherd. Because as helpless sheep, we will find a shepherd. But let's try to find the good shepherd. And so today we'll walk through this passage and I hope to answer the question, what does it mean to be the good shepherd? What does it mean that Jesus claims that? And my goal in doing that is so that we would trust in him more and seek to know him more. So that we would ultimately just rest in the good shepherd and what he does and come to grips with just being a sheep. Ba, 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 ba. So as we step into the text today, what does it mean to be the good shepherd? This is what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that our shepherd is a hired hand. If you know, want to know what God thought about the hired hands as shepherds, you can go back. It's all over the Old Testament, but most prominently, Ezekiel 34, Zechariah 9 to 14. God tells you what he thinks of the hired hands. These are the kings and the priests of the Old Testament Israel. These are the people that God put in position to shepherd his people so that they would know him, so that they would keep idolatry out, so that his people would thrive. And they didn't do their job at all. 
They let the wolves run rampant among the people. They let idolatry in because all they were concerned about was stuffing their pockets full of the sheep's wool and the sheep's meat. They were running over the sheep for their own betterment. That's what the kings and priests of the Old Testament are doing. And there's this whole story of God sending them into exile and bringing them back. And Jesus is standing with the people who have seen that story unfold. They know what the Old Testament, the bad shepherds were like. And he's standing there with the Pharisees. The Pharisees who are kind of standing in the place of shepherds now. And he's talking about what it means to be a hired hand. Now the immediate context of this is really important because what Jesus is saying is that these people are like the hired hands of the Old Testament. These Pharisees that are standing before him. This whole conversation is spurred on by John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, what Jesus does is he heals a man born blind. That's a kind of miracle that nobody had ever heard of at that time. Nobody heals people who are born blind. Doctors today can't heal people who are born blind. Only the creator of the universe can heal people who are born blind. And Jesus does it. So unmistakably, he is a man of God. And yet the Pharisees don't want to believe it. And they go so far trying not to believe it that when this blind man tells them just the truth of who healed him, they want to cast him out of the synagogue. You see, they don't care for the sheep. And if there's any mistake about why they don't care for the sheep, it comes up again in John chapter 11. After Jesus raises the dead man Lazarus, he shows clearly that he is certainly from God They say, we need to get rid of this man before he takes our place and our nation. What they care about is self-preservation. And that's because they're the hired hand. The sheep don't belong to them. So when the wolf comes, they run. And you might think, well, obviously I am not going to go to these kind of shepherds. But are you sure? Because I think when circumstances get desperate enough, we tend to lean on whoever's around. What if inflation keeps going up? What if social security gets cut back? Health care prices continue to increase. Maybe we'll lean on a shepherd then. Maybe then we begin to lean on a hired hand. Mao, Putin, Castro, those names didn't come into power by accident. They were asked for. Hired hands. And when those hired hands get control, they get control based on promises that they speak. But they don't control things for the sheep. They control things for themselves. And here in the United States of America, every four years, whether it's a new shepherd or the same old shepherd, we get to hear new promises again. Will we buy into those shepherds? Or maybe for us, it's not the finances. Maybe it's just we need that place to belong. And well, there's that place at the school that will give me a place to belong or or that place out there in the community that will give me that place to belong. Uh, And they don't judge me. They just let me be who I am. There's just the one thing that they really don't like it when people talk about being Christian or their faith life or religion in general, especially as it pertains to Christ. And maybe, maybe we lean on that group as our shepherd, as our hired hand. Or maybe we despair of finding a hired hand who makes living in this world easy at all and we take a step back and we retreat from reality and let the hired hands be the the stuff we put on television, the reality TV shows or, or whatever it is that we're watching in the sports world today, the magic in their playoff run, the lightning in their playoff run and we step back from reality. You see, when circumstances of our life get difficult, the easiest thing to do is to step back and lean on whatever shepherd's speaking the promise right now and to lean on the hired hand. 
but the hired hands care nothing for the sheep. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And this is what we need to see is that the good shepherd loves his sheep. He loves his sheep enough to lay down his life for them. He loves his sheep enough to go to the cross. That's the good shepherd. So first, the good shepherd loves his sheep. He's not a hired hand. He actually cares about and owns the sheep. Second, the good shepherd knows his sheep. It's amazing to me how much voice we give to people who don't know us in our society. Every time we turn on the television, we're giving voices to people who don't know anything about my situation. They might know a lot about the world. They might know a decent amount about the law or how how God is working things out. They might just have a worldly wisdom, but they don't know me. And so even as people, whether they're Instagram influencers, newscasters, share things about the world, they're not sharing them so that I directly apply them to my life. Or maybe they are, but even if they are, they don't know my life completely. See, the Pharisees are standing in this place. They know a decent amount about God's law, but they don't know Jesus And they don't know the people they're ministering to like Jesus does. Jesus knows you more deeply than you know yourself. He knows you more deeply than I ever could. Jesus is the one who knit you together in your mother's womb. And he says, I know you just as the Father knows me. That's profound. The Father has known Jesus from eternity. Jesus knows you that well. He knows every breath you've taken. He knows every hair on your head, or as Pastor Elliot told us last week, he knows every hair that used to be on your head. Every breath you take, every time you get up and lay down, every day of your life. And sometimes that doesn't sound like good news to me. It was 1 a.m. on Thursday for me when I was standing over the crib telling my son, it's time to go back to sleep now. And I left the room that I began to meditate on this verse and realize sometimes God knowing me doesn't make it easier. Because if God knows all of my struggles and frustrations, why doesn't he do anything about it? Maybe you've thought before, if God knows every hair that used to be on my head, why doesn't he keep a few of them up there? Or maybe, maybe if God knows every breath I've ever taken and every breath every individual has ever taken, why does he let me stand at the bedside where my spouse or my sister or brother or father or mother struggles for breath at the end of life? He knows every day of our lives, why couldn't he give my granddad a few more so that I'd get a chance to say goodbye? If he knows when I get up and when I lie down, why am I awake at 1 a.m. on Thursday morning? If God knows everything about me, why doesn't he just free me from this? And I think one thing that we have to realize about sheep is sheep are not incredibly self-aware. I don't know if you know this, if you've ever heard of casting, this is something that sheep will do, and it basically means they just fall over and can't get back up. Uh, This happens a lot with pregnant ewes, but sometimes what happens is a sheep, if they're not pregnant, uh, they're so top-heavy that they'll lie down on a ditch, and when they decide to lie down, they can't really stop themselves. They'll hit the ditch, and they'll capsize, and their feet will be up in the air. Now, if you see a sheep doing this, it's actually a really dire situation because they can't roll back over. So if if you see a sheep with the feet in the air, go help it out. Uh, Roll it over. But you see, they're so unself-aware that they don't even know where their bodies are. They don't know what's best for them. They might think they're lying down to take a nap, and yet they're lying down for their death as they capsize and won't be able to eat anything for the rest of their lives. We're like sheep. We don't know what's good for us. We don't actually know what is best. But we have a good shepherd who does. Who knows us more fully than we can know ourselves. And I know that's incredibly difficult to hear about when you're going through the struggle right now. But what God has for you is good. 
when he takes you through the valley of the shadow of death, it's because he's leading you to green pastures and still waters. When he sets the table before you in the presence of your enemies, it's so that he can fill your cup so that it overflows. You see, the end goal of our good shepherd is always for our good. And the beautiful thing about it is that he knows what is for my good so much more than I could possibly know for myself. He's a good shepherd. A good shepherd loves A good shepherd knows his sheep. And finally, a good shepherd protects. I promise I won't spend that much time on this because I already spent a lot of time on those. But the good shepherd protects in verses 17 and 18. The the important part of these verses is it shows us that Jesus has a story of authority. He has a story of authority. He has the authority to say, I'm going to lay my life down. And I have the power to pick it up again. Right, which means that he is the only one that can be the good shepherd. We can have some decent shepherds here and there. Paul calls your pastors shepherds and hopefully we do an okay job here and there. But we won't know you as fully. We won't love you as fully. And we certainly cannot lay down our life and take it up. This is an authority that only Jesus has so that only Jesus can be the good shepherd. Everyone else in our life, they might be helpful. They might be good sheep. When the wolves come, we might want to be close to them. But they don't have this kind of power. They're not the good shepherd. And this authority actually plays itself out in a story so that we can look back at it. As Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. He's looking right at the Pharisees who are about to plot his destruction. He says, no one can take my life from me because he's going to lay it down freely. He's going to go to the cross of his own volition and he's going to do it so that he can take his life back up again. So that when he rises from the dead, and this is the story of Easter morning, this is the story that is our entire hope. When he rises from the dead, he will conquer death for us eternally. That means that you you don't end in death. That means your loved ones, their lives don't end in death. But Jesus' resurrection is powerful enough to raise every soul out of the grave and his life is powerful enough to lead those who trust in him to life eternal with him. This is the resurrection power. It is the power to protect. And I think sometimes we let that power, we let that story fade as if it's like the backdrop of our lives. It's the mountains in the background of the scene. When really, it is the ground that we stand on. It shouldn't be something that fades into the background as if knowing Jesus is important on Sunday morning, but the other days of the week, I got to get to know the people around me. No, this relationship is more important than any relationship you have with work, any relationship you have in your life because this is the one that makes life last for eternity. This is the one that promises the abundant life you were created to live. Jesus is the good shepherd who loves, who knows, who protects. And yet we so often live our lives restless. Here's a quick diagnostic and I'll do this quickly. This week, is there something that you look back on that still just bugs you, that you can't really shake? Are there finances that just feel too tight and you're not sure how God's going to use them? Is there time that feels like you don't have enough in the week? Or is it energy that you feel like you're so stretched thin? I think all of these are symptoms of being restless. That doesn't mean there's symptoms of being out of the kingdom because our good shepherd is still the shepherd for you. But there's symptoms sometimes of us insisting on not being sheep or us insisting on finding different shepherds. And if you're in any of those places today, what I want to encourage you to do is if there's that thing that's been bugging you, lay it at the feet of the cross. If it's finances that I feel like I just can't get enough 
Pray about giving a little more over to God. If it's time that you can't get enough, pray about spending more time getting to know him. If it's energy that you can't get enough, pray about spending a little bit more energy serving our Lord. And it's not so that you can get more of that stuff, but it's so that we can all learn to sing, I just want to be a sheep. Ba, 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 ba. And actually like that song. <laughs> because we have a good shepherd. A shepherd who is far better than we can be for ourselves. A shepherd who is far better than anything we can find. A shepherd who loves us with a love fuller than we can imagine. Who knows us more deeply than we know ourselves. And who protects us with the only authority that actually can. So let's find ways to rest in him because he's your good shepherd. Amen. And now may this peace which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. We have a weekly awakening question to continue considering this morning. Are you resting in his protection or are you restless? That's the protection of the good shepherd. Are you resting in his protection Or are you restless? Find some time this week to have that conversation with another believer.